Coming to the podium, we have our Dean for the School of Agriculture, Fisheries, and Human Sciences, Dr. Edmund Buckner. Thank you for the uh, hearty round of applause. I appreciate that. <laughs> Feels so welcome, especially since I'm supposed to be here to welcome you and give you the greeting. But uh, so let me do that right now. I extend greetings to you, the American Association of Family and Consumer Sciences. And I apologize that I haven't been with you the whole while. I've been double booked. I just uh, left an international programs uh, function. We had to do some training, so I was doing some training there. And uh, um, as the director of international programs, I have to wear a lot of hats, but I didn't want to leave you out. I wanted to be here, and so I made, I drove really fast to be here. <laughs> Um, well, I hope that you're enjoying yourselves on our campus. It's really beautiful in springtime here at the University of Arkansas Pine Bluff. And so we hope that uh, you've been able to take in some of the sights and sounds of our campus. Yeah. Well. <laughs> um, let me get to the, to the meat of this. Your mission is all about helping communities to achieve the optimal quality of life. And that's not unlike the mission of the School of Agriculture, Fisheries, and Human Sciences, and the university as a whole, uh, being as we're a land-grant university. Our mission is to serve the underserved. And so those two missions are very, very compatible. They actually go hand in hand. Um, and so with that said, um, really looking at why we got involved in this profession in the first place, it's all about helping people. And, uh, it's obviously not because you want to make a lot of money, because there's a lot of, not, there's not a lot of, is there a lot of money in this profession? It's all about the people, isn't it? And so that's one of the things that will take you and drive you farther. It'll make you stay up late night to do more work than any dollar will. And so I want to urge you to stay the course. I want to urge you to continue to strive to improve the quality of lives of people, to improve the lives of people that are in these communities. So in the process, we're actually uh, helping communities. And so I want to actually I want to ask you to stay the course with that. Uh, I want to, to urge you to remember to continue to make a difference on a daily basis. Because if you, if you have that on your mind when you get up in the morning that today I'm going to make a difference, then it's a whole lot easier to sleep at night because you really feel a sense of accomplishment. Much like a carpenter does when he builds a house, you can go home and say, I built that, and I see that there. And you can see that in the lives of people that you help and that you touch. Um, so your work is improving our communities, it's improving the lives of people one person at a time, and I want to urge you and applaud you for doing that work and urge you to continue to do that. And so with that said, I'm going to, to go back to my seat. All right, next we will have an early childhood discussion, making local connections for the sake of Arkansas's children. We have coming to the front will be Miss Eleanor Wheeler. Ms. Eleanor Wheeler is the senior policy analyst. Um, she joined the Arkansas Advocate for Children and Families team in October of 2013. This Austin, Texas native is a Hendrix alum and received her master's in applied economics from the University of Houston. Her ultimate goal is to visit every state park in Arkansas. Oh, we have some beautiful state parks. Um, and the mission of Arkansas Advocates for Children and Families is to ensure that all children and their families have the resources and opportunities to lead healthy and productive lives and to realize their full potential. Joining her will be our UAPB's own Dr. Marilyn Bailey Jefferson. She is assistant professor in of the UA, assistant professor in the Human Sciences Department and the UAPB Early Head Start Child Care Partnering Executive Director. She's also the director of the University of Arkansas Palm Bluff Child Development Center. For the past 22 years, Dr. Marilyn Bailey Jefferson has developed skills as an early childhood educator an advocate for children and families. Her career began as a nurse, nursing assistant, working primarily with children diagnosed with developmental delay and as administrator of a home-based childcare facility, serving families in Central California. 
These children as well as her own, as well as her own three children, inspired a passion for the field of early childhood. She has been privileged to serve as a children's services specialist and trainer with San Bernardino County School District in California, as well as the California Department of Education's Elite West Ed program for infant toddler care. Marilyn's life journey has led her back home to Arkansas where she has been given an opportunity to voice issues concerning children and families as a guest columnist with the Pond Love Commercial, publishing articles entitled, Is There Social Justice in Education? Resist the Temptation to Give Up, Democracy in Education, and Black Language and the Education Gap. Another great joy was serving as Child Care Health Coordinator and Infant Toddler Specialist with Jefferson Comprehensive Care. Child Care Aware of Southeast Arkansas under the leadership of the late Miss Elaine Davis. Currently, Dr. Bailey Jefferson carries the torch as a Child Development Center Director, Assistant Professor, and Early Head Start Child Care Partnership Executive Director here at the University of Arkansas at Pine Bluff. Her academic accomplishments include a doctoral degree in educational leadership from Fielding Graduate University in Santa Barbara, California, and a Master's of Arts degree in Human Development from Pacific Oaks University in Pasadena, California. So we welcome Dr. Marilyn Bailey Jefferson and Ms. Eleanor Wheeler. Hello, hello, hello. Uh, great to be here. Um, I'm here to learn. I'm just going to tell you I'm having such a great time. So I'm going to pass the mic back to uh, Ms. Wheeler. Um, for Since 2006, I've been back in the state of Arkansas and hearing a lot about the work that uh, Arkansas advocates uh, are doing and oftentimes I will go to my department chair, uh, Dr. Brenda Martin, and I'll tell her I need to go to a meeting or to a training and she might ask, well, what do you want to go to that training for? <laughs> and so I think today we will get some clarity on exactly what is quality child care, uh, why do we do what we do every day as far as working diligently to make sure that the teachers get the adequate training because as you know babies don't stay babies they grow up and we need them to be productive citizens in society but there's a lot of work that needs to happen in order for children to be able to get there particularly when uh, maybe the children don't have the best start in life so um, Ms. Wheeler. Thank you. Um, well, I'm really happy to be here and, uh, and talking about the work that I do at Arkansas Advocates. And if you're not familiar, we are a nonpartisan uh, nonprofit group based in Little Rock, and we work on public policy advocacy uh, uh, with kids in mind. A lot of times at the Capitol, uh, there are strong lobby groups out there that don't necessarily re represent the best needs of kids in our state. Um, I, we work on a bunch of different issue areas, education, health, um, family economic security, budget. I do a lot of work on uh, child poverty and uh, taxes, actually. And uh, one of the things that I've learned or I've taken away from my experiences at Advocates is uh, everything is so related can start talking about health care and before you know it you're talking about taxes and before you know it, you're talking about education um, because to fulfill our mission of making sure that kids reach their full potential like you mentioned it, it takes so many it takes supporting them in so many different ways um, so I want to I, I end up being sort of the data geek <laughs> of our crew um, so I'm going to walk you through some of some of that and hopefully I won't I won't lose anyone's attention. I will try and not make it too nerdy, but um, it is important to look at the trends um, and how they, what they say about our state and how we're doing compared to other states. Um, uh, when, you, when you're talking about poverty and child poverty uh, in Arkansas, I think the big takeaway is to disaggregate, and that just means don't, don't look at everything as a whole. Um, you know, if uh, 10 kids walk into the school nurse and you tell the school nurse, well, their average temperature is normal, that doesn't mean that one kid doesn't have a fever. You need to look, separate 
uh, different areas and different groups to see if one uh, kid has a problem, you know, we need to address that problem in a different way. And it's the same way when you're looking at data. Um, you know, the, the national poverty rate for kids is about 22% if you look across the whole United States. But that's certainly not the case for every state. Uh, there's a stripe of higher child poverty in our nation from like Arizona up to uh, West Virginia, a higher concentration of child poverty. If you zoom in to Arkansas specifically, there's a stripe of child poverty in the counties in the Delta. Okay, so um, in our state, you know, we uh, have a child poverty rate higher than the national average, but even within our state, there's a lot of variation. Um, the child poverty goes from 26% as a whole in our state and can be as high as 50% in some of these uh, Delta counties. And if you break that down in a different way, you can see that very young children uh, experience poverty in a different way than, than uh, older kids. And, and one way to think about that is, you know, when kids are younger, their parents are younger too, starting off in their career, uh, getting established, saving up for those big, you know, purchases and maybe a down payment on a house. So um, when kids are younger, their parents are also younger and uh, more likely to be early on in their careers. Um, the, the outcome of that, unfortunately, is some of uh, the worst outcomes from child poverty are more, uh, are more dramatic at a young age. So, so that's something to keep in mind. Uh, so very young children in Arkansas, um, kids under 18, 26% in Arkansas live in poverty. But if you just look at children under five, that's 29%. So it's much higher, almost a third of very young kids in our state live in poverty. Um, so don't, I hate, this sounds like doom and gloom, but don't panic. Don't panic. Um, there's been some good news recently, we're seeing some data that came out um, about how our, our child, child poverty has actually uh, decreased for the first time in six years recently. So, so that's some good news. Um, we just really recently got some new data that, that might make it look more like we're plateauing, but we did for a long time have a steady increase in child poverty, so now. So that, that pattern of, of increasing steadily year after year it's, looks like it's tapering off a little bit, which is good news. Um, and and uh, the other good news is that there's things that we can do. Uh, at Advocates, we believe that public policy works. We've seen it work in other states. Making smart public policy choices makes a big difference in, in outcomes. States that invest in quality early childhood education have positive outcomes outcomes down the line and um, you know that's not the that's education isn't my expertise area but I do look at the data and I know that when you keep um, quality in your early child education early childhood education the um, payoffs for that uh, last for decades you can see that and, and that comes back to you know your your earnings potential later in life and and then the, and then your second generation's earning potential um, uh, Did you have a question? Oh. So here's an example. Now, Ms. Wheeler is giving you all the policy side. Mm -hmm. The reality, of course, here on the campus, we have a laboratory. We have Arkansas Better Chance funding, which Arkansas advocates lobby for us to be able to get that funding. Um, so there is data to show, or there are data, to show that students who come through Arkansas Better Chance programs have better outcomes than children who do not. Because for one, the ratio is one to 10. Now imagine being one person in a classroom with 20 or 25 students. Do you think the children will receive more individualized care in a ratio where there's one to 10 or one to 20 or one to 25? And that's just one example. With the early Head Start funding, of course, that we have on campus, um, I've watched families 
who, of course, they have to income qualify. So we're talking about families who are at poverty or below poverty, meaning a family of four making possibly anywhere between roughly about 11000 a year. That's poverty. If you are a family of four and your annual income falls at 20000 or below, that's poverty. So we're talking about the difference between being 100% poverty or 200% poverty, okay? So um, I had a, a conversation recently with teachers when we were reviewing applications, and just in the meeting, we were able to see that families who started in our program at or below poverty, they were driving a car that could barely make it on the parking lot. This is a real example. In three years of that family being with our program, they're driving a more equipped car. They've moved from um, the projects or what we call low income housing to more adequate housing. That's the reality of what a quality program can do that is state funded. And that's, what, that's the point that Ms. Wheeler is trying to make. Thank you. That, that's great to have the personal stories too to back it up. Um, sometimes it's hard to be looking at numbers all day and I, uh, I don't get to hear those stories as much as I would like to. Um, so uh, just to, to reiterate, um, it does matter. It's, it's the whole family structure and I think that your story illustrates that beautifully. Um, you know, we, we, children aren't living in poverty um, on their own. They have, they have, they live in poverty because their parents can't find the good jobs that they need, um, or they don't have the resources or the programs that help them get where they want to go. Um, another, another reason that it's important to look at data disaggregated and that's separated is that um, you know we have record low unemployment rates as a whole in Arkansas right now. Um, and, and that's something that a lot of people, you'll see articles about that in, in the paper while uh, it's, uh, it's uh, under 5% for the first time in a really long time. But we have plenty of counties in Arkansas that have still near 10% unemployment rates. So, so if you look at the state as a whole versus looking at different areas of Arkansas, you, know, you, can't, you can't apply the same uh, logic to to the to every area because because some some places really are um, having a hard time and uh, just for an example of, of why that that logic doesn't work very well um, recently this legislative session uh, they they passed a law that makes it harder for us to as a state apply for federal waivers to expand um, our SNAP program. Um, and the federal waivers could be used to extend the amount of time that people can use SNAP um, if they live in, a, in, a, in an area with exceptionally high unemployment. Um, and we still have counties that would qualify for those waivers and allow people to stay on the program as they continue to look for a job. It's just a lot harder in some places to find that work. Um, and so recently, I think because of this attitude that, well, we're doing well as a state overall, um, uh, they felt that they, they didn't need to, to use those waivers. Um, so there are other things that, that contribute to that, those differences in, in areas. Um, and it's not just where you live. There, there are structures and there's a history in Arkansas um, that, that disenfranchise certain groups, people of color, depending on where you live. Uh, our landlord-tenant laws are the worst in the nation. I could go on and on about that. If you guys have any questions or want to talk to me about that, we have two basic. About a third of people in Arkansas rent. There's a huge disparity between um, communities of color home ownership rates and white community home ownership rates. And, uh, and that ties into our landlord-tenant laws. The two big issues with our landlord-tenant laws right now are that we're the only state in the, in the country that doesn't have what's called a warranty of habitability. Every other state has something that basically says you can't, your landlord has an obligation to make sure that you have a locking front door, 
that you don't have sewage leaking up into the house, that there aren't any pest infestations. So, so tenants in Arkansas have no legal recourse to say, I'm withholding rent because my house is unlivable. You can't do that. It becomes very expensive and people get trapped in this cycle of their only option is to just leave, lose that deposit, um, uproot their families. You know, it's very stressful and expensive to, to, to relocate. Um, and so that's, that's the one, the warranty of habitability. The other side of, we're the only state, the, the other side of um, why our landlord tenant laws are bad in Arkansas is that we're the only state that um, criminalizes uh, a late rental payment. So we're the only state where that would go to criminal court as opposed to a civil court. So you can technically, and you, people um, in certain counties, Pulaski, for example, Pulaski County, a judge overturned the ability to do that. But there are many places in Arkansas where still you can be put in jail if you're late, just one day. Um, the, the, it's an incredible story, um, and I don't remember all of the details of the case, but in Pulaski County where they, they overturned it, um, it was because of um, a woman who was renting, the landlord said that uh, she owed him something like $20,000. Understandably, she did not have that money to pay what the landlord said that she owed, but she wasn't allowed to have her case heard until she paid what the landlord said. So you, so you can't, it's the reason he, that his argument for overturning it is that you're um, being denied your constitutional right to trial because of that. So there's still, you know, Arkansas Access to Justice is really involved in this work and they are trying to get a broader over, um, ruling to overturn that practice in Arkansas. But again, um, policies like this, we worked really hard to try and get some improvements to the landlord-tenant laws at the Capitol this session, but unfortunately the good bills um, ended up not moving forward. Um, but again, that these policies impact people's lives every day, uh, and they impact family economic security. So you're talking about your relationship, the power dynamic between a tenant and a landlord um, impacts uh, people living in poverty in Arkansas and impacts their ability to succeed. And if you're, the, some of the research done by UAMS is really incredible. They did a, a survey just in Arkansas. Um, and you know, the, the um, not just physical health outcomes from living in uh, uh, houses that aren't upkept. Um, not being, and then there's, it's the physical health, uh, the uh, financial health, and the um, mental and emotional stress of living in a place where the, the stories from, the, from that survey are people um, can't sleep at night, their kids are going to the emergency room because of uh, so many bug bites on, on them that they uh, have to go to be hospitalized. Um, so it's, it's a really, compel this is a really compelling area that, that we're working on and trying to, to make those connections between, you know, we're, our partnerships with uh, Arkansas Access to Justice with uh, UAMS and with um, really anyone who's interested in, in helping us because it's all connected. Um, and, and again, that's one of the big takeaways that I have from, from all of this work. So again, let me give you all a reality check. In the center, of course, I get to hear about everything that's going on. Mother came to me and she said, well, um, I've been turned into DHS. And she was just sobbing, just sobbing. This was just a few weeks ago. Um, she explained to me that she, had, uh, she was having some housing problems. She needed to relocate, um, which meant that, of course, she had to uh, pay light water and gas and all of that to get it uh, reconnected in the new space. And she did not have enough money. Um, she wanted to know, of course, because she worked in the center for a little while. Well, you know, there are laws. You have to have a background check. If you work on UAPB, Child Development Center site, you got to have proper training and all that. People know I'm very strict about that kind of thing uh, because I like to follow the law and I want the children to be well taken care of. So that left her with no other options except to work 
a swing shift position. So where were her children? Mm -hmm. Why do you think DHS got involved? Because in order for her to meet the requirements, she had to work a job that kept her away at night, which meant she tried to have her eldest child take care of the youngest child. And then DHS got involved. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that, that reminds me of, um, in, in, when we work on policies, we, we like to think of it as the two generation approach to, for that very reason. Um, because what, what ha what's going on with the parents' lives is obviously going to impact the kids' lives. Um, and so we, we also advocate for um, something related. So we, we advocate for early childhood education availability for that reason. Um, and uh, also for um, paid maternity and, and parental leave. Um, so some good news from the Capitol this year is uh, we did expand access to uh, uh, state employees are now uh, able to take paid maternity leave. And, and that's a huge, first step, especially in our region, uh, I would love to see everyone in Arkansas have access to paid parental leave, um, but it's a great first step for, for state employees to be, to be able to take that leave um, because so many women are, have a hard time um, continuing in their career uh, after childbirth. You know, most most child care centers won't even accept uh, kids before six weeks. So if you don't have that s support structure, if you don't have grandma or grandpa down the street to help you out, you're, you're really stuck, especially if it's the choice between, you know, can I go this long without a paycheck? That's one of the number one reasons that women go back uh, to work immediately is because they can't um, afford to miss those paychecks. Uh, so, so there's the, again, so many things come down to the, the family economic security side of it. You know, can I afford to, to uh, take this leave, for example? Um, and also the, the health and emotional well-being side. All the studies show that if you, are, if you have access to paid leave, your kids are more likely to uh, not miss their immunizations and their doctor's checkups. The, um, there's a study that shows that maternal mental health decades after uh, giving birth is, is improved significantly if that woman had access to, to paid parental leave. So your, your uh, income is shown to be better if you have access to paid parental leave. But this is something that especially low-income women in Arkansas don't have access to because uh, they're less likely to work for employers that that provide that. So this, I see this as a great first step towards um, having a more well-rounded two-generation approach to, to helping families get ahead in Arkansas. Um, just providing that first step and hopefully, you know, we'll keep fighting for expanding that in, in other ways to more uh, families in Arkansas. Did you have comment? Oh, I'm Where waiting for you to get to the next point. Oh, which one is this? <laughs> oh, I'm gonna... Lender. oh, okay. Um, so, another huge um, issue for family economic security, of course, like I said, is connected to all different kinds of health and education, well-being, um, success for kids, it has so much to do with um, the quality of jobs that their parents have and their access to quality financial institutions. Um, so I want to give a little bit of background before I get into predatory lending. I recently heard a presentation from Southern Bancor, and uh, it was in Little Rock, so it was focused in Little Rock, but I think the concepts really still apply. He showed us a map of Little Rock, and if you're familiar with the Hillcrest area, that's a much higher property value area. Um, and on the map, you could see uh, dots, and all the dots represented a bank. There were so many dots in the Hillcrest area. You couldn't probably turn around without seeing a bank in the Hillcrest area. Um, below 630, which is a much lower income area, there, there were two for the, whole, for the whole area below 630. Almost nothing uh, down there represented by banking. 
So uh, why is that? You know, there's a really big problem with um, access to financial institutions for low-income areas, and it's the same situation in rural areas. It's hard to get banks to want to put locations in uh, lower-income rural areas in Arkansas um, because you know no one's the the profit margin is different. Um, but what that what that happens is it leads to Arkansas. We're I the last time I looked, we were last in. Uh, the amount of the percentage of people who have savings account. So compared to all other states, our our uh, citizens have uh, the lowest rate of people who have savings accounts. So, uh, and what does that say for our ability to have long-term financial stability in our families? It's really hard. And if you don't even have a bank that you can get to easily, um, if you didn't grow up with with saving or you don't. You know, sometimes people just don't, they don't have that financial education uh, that's necessary for that. And what happens is that leaves people vulnerable to predatory lenders. Um, people who will trap you, you have, you know, you're, maybe you're the family with the, the car that could barely make it to the parking lot. You really want to keep that job, but you've got this $300 repair that pops up. Do I go to a payday lender and take that risk so that I don't lose my job? So many people choose that because they don't have a, another option, another viable financial institution to help them out. Then what happens, they have, they pay that $300 back three, three or four times because they can't get out of that, those high fees and those gimmicks that uh, keep you in that predatory lending. Um, so, fin so quality financial in institutions are so important for that reason, and, and Southern Bancorp does a great job. If you aren't familiar with their work and you're interested in this topic, I encourage you to, to check that out. They, um, their mission is to make sure that Arkansans have that quality financial access that they need. And, uh, and a, a unique thing about Arkansas is that uh, we do have a constitutional rate cap on interest rates in our state. That's uh, that's rare. Um, a lot of other, if you cross the border into Texas, you'll see uh, payday lenders on every corner. We don't have that anymore in Arkansas as of 2009. Okay, so it took a lot of work from our attorney general uh, to advocacy groups. AARP did a lot of work on pushing out these predatory lenders. So the corollary of that is we still need to make sure there are good options out there because people do need financial options that work for them. We need to make sure it's not someone who's charging 400% uh, interest rates every year, which is what we were seeing with um, these predatory lenders. So the update on that, you know, we did so much work and uh, a lot of people are really proud of, uh, rightly so, of being in a state that doesn't allow that um, banking institutions to take advantage of our citizens. Um, unfortunately, the same people who owned the, the payday lenders way back when are coming back with under a loophole. There's one in Hope, Arkansas. There's one in Little Rock, in North Little Rock. I drive past it all the time and I get upset because <laughs> I see it and it's, it's a payday lender, effectively. But they don't call them themselves that. They, they, but they book themselves. They say, oh, we're not lending you. We're a brokerage. We have a broker, we'll, we'll find you a loan for a fee, but we're not loaning you anything, okay? So, but really what uh, the concept, the, the rules in Arkansas are clear. If it's a fee, if it, I mean, if it looks like a loan, smells like a loan, it's a loan, those interest rates, those fees that you're saying aren't interest rates, they count. But we have to depend on our um, attorney general and other institutions to enforce that rule and we're having a hard time getting them to shut their doors. So this year, uh, we did have some positive legislation that um, clarified the language in the law, even though it's already, it's already there. It clarified the language in the law saying, listen, you, what they're called as credit service organizations or CSOs, and that's the, um, we're just a, ser we're servicing another loan, but we're not alone. Um, that clarifies it, that should shut the door on those CSOs. 
So I'm keeping an eye on that uh, to, see, to see where that goes. Um, but predatory lending is a huge problem and uh, we need to make sure that we keep the bad loans out of Arkansas because it can really trap people for a long time and we need to make sure that we support groups like Southern Bank Corps who are providing, because it is important, you can't just have nothing, you know, um, you need to have a positive uh, community-based financial institution to help people as well. I concur. <laughs> <laughs> Um, ha having lived in California over 20 years, it was a huge, huge problem there as well. Um, I think for those of us who are educators, um, as we work with the students in the classroom, it is just imperative that we work with the students to give them this information, not only about the predatory lending as far as it relates to payday lending type loans, but also with credit cards. Um, you know, when I'm talking to my students, whether it's in family development or my administration course for child care centers, I talk to uh, students, you know, they have to do a budget. And then they start talking about, well, if I'm not going to make this money, I can borrow it on credit card. I said, well, so now what's your annual fee on credit card? Well, then they go and research it and they find out that their annual fee might be $29, $39, $49. I said, okay, so add up $40 annually, and how long you plan on keeping this card? Multiply it by 12. You know, think about what else you can be doing with that money. And so, you know, talk, I think it's important for us to talk to students about developing a plan to build their credit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, credit, credit is such a huge part of Family Economic Security as well, and, and again, I'm plugging my friends at Southern Bank where they do a lot of programs that that help people build their credit um, because that's so important for, for changing the structures in Arkansas, for making sure that we don't have, uh, that we have better home ownership rates in, in all parts of Arkansas. Um, another structure that I like to mention uh, is our, is our <clears throat> tax structure. That's one of my main uh, issues that I, that I do research on. And uh, it's not like this in every state, but in Arkansas, uh, low-income families actually pay a much, much higher share of their income to state and local taxes compared to the top 1%. So if you, if you make more than about $350,000 a year, you're paying about 6% of your income to the state of Arkansas in some form of tax gas tax, income tax, property tax, sales tax, about 6% of what you make if you're in the top 1% in Arkansas goes back to the state to pay for all the things that we care about, roads, schools, parks, et cetera. Um, if you make less than about $40,000 a year, um, you pay twice that. So 12% of your income goes. Everyone in the group, so you could, it's, a, it's a graph and, I didn't even bring a PowerPoint because people don't like to look at my nerdy charts and stuff, but uh, if you imagine a chart, uh, everyone, every group that's under $40,000 pays about 12% of their income. And then the more you make, that it just goes down and down and down and down and down. And so you get to people making uh, over $350,000 a year and they pay the least. Um, so that's a huge problem for, for our state. People don't recognize that. They think of taxes, I think for, for a lot of people when they think of taxes, they think income tax. Income tax in our state is graduated, so doesn't it make sense that that really rich person is paying more, a higher share than me? You would think so, but when you put into account sales tax, property tax, all the other taxes that impact um, low-income people more, those, uh, those groups pay a much higher share of their income. And so we are working on rebalancing that out. Um, another thing to remember is that higher income folks in our state make a lot of times they make their money on non-employment type adventures. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so the stock market, buying and selling real estate, that income is taxed very differently in our state. Unbelievably, two years ago, um, they voted to say, 
listen, and that's called capital gains income. Uh, the legislature decided that if you have capital gains income in excess of $10 million a year, I don't know, I, I don't ever, I don't know if anyone else in here does. <laughs> if you make more than $10 million a year in capital gains, you don't have to pay any state taxes on that, on that money after $10 million. So why are we doing that when we are already asking our lowest income workers to pay 12% of what they go to work and earn uh, every day? So, so that's what I'm passionate about working on tax policy, and it might sound um, boring, but really it's, it influences people's lives, and, um, and it's really important for fi family financial security. I concur. You concur? Mm -hmm. She's telling me I only have five minutes left, so I don't know if anyone had a question. I thought I would open it up for that. If anyone has a question? Yeah. yeah. I don't know what you said already. How did you get into public policy? Um, how did I get into public policy? I, well, I went to Hendricks and then I got my master's in economics. Um, and I worked, actually, this is sort of personal, but I worked in the, the pharmaceutical industry for a couple years in Boston. Um, and, I, and I really hated it, to be honest with you. Mm -hmm. Um, I just, I didn't, I didn't find really any meaning in my work and I just didn't like it. And so I, I was on a job hunt and I found out about advocates and I read their mission and I just, it felt perfect and I applied and I have never regretted <laughs> moving back out of Boston and I've learned so much from uh, the people that I work with and, and working in public policy, I think anyone who's interested in, in something that you feel like you, you're helping people and you're also learning a lot every day. Um, I love it. So, yeah. Are there any other questions? Well, thank you all, thank you all, thank you all. Enjoy the rest of the conference. Mm -hmm.